anybody know anything about that? Oh, the blood of Jesus, it will never lose its power. I think I said that one more time. Can we sing that? Oh, come on, y'all. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, oh, the blood of Jesus. It will never lose its power. Give him some praise for his blood. Come on, give him praise for the blood. You provide the fire. I'll provide the sacrifice. You pour out your spirit.
don't have to run out of fear.
uh, spirit that tries to attack these women in this place. I thank you, God, that we walk by faith and we don't walk by sight. We will not be a generation of women that walk around that are wimpy, that complain, that are emotional, that are led by their feelings. You see, we walk in the spirit and we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We will not be manipulative women in the name of Jesus. We will have pure, right hearts before you, Jesus. We know we will stand before you, God, and, and be judged on every thought, every action, everything that we've ever written. So I thank you, God, that we've repented of our sins. We, we pour ourselves out, God, so you can fill us up. The only way you can fill us up is if we pour out and we let go of all of who we are. We thank you for Cornelius. We thank you for the word that he's coming to, to preach in due season right now. God, I, I pray that you're softening every single heart in this place. Take on the hearts of stone, replace them with the heart of flesh. One that's sensitive to your spirit. One that knows, knows your name. I thank you that this isn't just some activity that we do, but instead we're, we're, we're ready to change. We're hungry for change, God. We didn't come here for fun or for play or to look cute. We came here intentionally seeking your face, God. So Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. It's all about you and for you. We thank you for every volunteer. We thank you for the singers, for the band. We thank you for the hotel workers. We thank you for everybody here. We thank you for their service. We pray that it's on to you, God, and they serve is on to you. They think is on to you. We thank you for every attendee. We pray, God, that their hearts are right before you. In Jesus' name we pray. As you can see, I'm not pregnant anymore. At last year's conference, I was 37 weeks pregnant with this nine pounder. And she's here, so I wanted to just introduce her to you guys. Her name's Taylor Milan. She's sleeping. Whenever I turn on worship music, she just crashes. I was gonna hand her over to my, my mother in love, but I said, you know what? She needs, she needs to be in this. She needs to see it. She needs to see what mommy does. And, and my prayer for her is that she will be bold for her generation, that she'll be a mouthpiece for her generation. She needs to know that what happens, and my prayer is that, that she's helping me lead these things one day. So it was on my heart as, as I was holding Taylor right there. If anybody here is you know, a mother or you're desiring to be mother, I wanna pray over your, your womb and I wanna pray over your babies. So every woman here, I pray, if you have children, lift your hands up. If you, if you desire to be pregnant one day, put your hand on your, on your womb. God, I just lift up these women here. I thank you for their children and their future children. Satan, you've got no authority over them. We bind you, we call you wrong. I thank you, God, that their children have a purpose and a plan. I thank you, God, they will not get into peer pressure, but instead they'll be leaders amongst their generations. I pray that their parents sow seeds into their heart. Regardless of the situation that's going on in their home, I pray that their children are bold for you, God. That they'll be able to decipher right from wrong. That the Holy Spirit will tug on their heart at a young age. And they'll be wise at a young age. And know your name at a young age. I pray, God, that these children will walk in your ways. I thank you that they'll be bold and courageous for you like David was as a child. I thank you for the plans. I pray your angels of God protect and keep them. And for the mothers that desire children one day, I thank you, God, that they cast their care onto you because you care for them. Like Hannah prayed and you heard her cry. I thank you, God, that you've heard their cries. And I thank you, God, if anybody in this place is married and desiring to be pregnant, I, I pray that it's your will that you fill up their womb. God, it is your will. And the thing is this, you've opened and you close our wounds. It's within your timing. So I just pray for their wounds, whatever's wrong. I pray you're making it right. I pray they cast down any fear. And they trust at the right time you'll bring these things to pass. God, you love these women. So I thank you for their lives. I thank you that they always live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, sis. Okay. Church. Now, if you know about telechurch, you've been rocking. 
with the Lindsay's for a really long time because we would just preach over the phone. And this is before people even started to do it. I remember telling him, even when we were courting, I said, babe, you're going to be such a, a, a soldier, such a general, such a commander for our generation. I truly believe it. And I've always looked up to him. Always. And then the, the Lord gave me an opportunity to, to marry him. I watched him for three years serve. And he didn't look at any person. He just served. He was focused on the Lord. And when I just always respected him. So it's just it's such an honor for me to, to introduce him today. I'm excited for the word that he's going to give. I pray your hearts are ready to receive it. You are truly never going to be the same after this night. Cornelius Lindsay. Praise God. All to Jesus. All to Jesus. All to Jesus. All to Jesus. You know, my, my wife is, uh, she's wonderful. She, um, what she didn't tell you is that she's the better part of me. She's the better part of me. I'm excited about the word tonight. I am. I'm excited about the word. So let's pray and let's jump right into this. Amen. Father, be unto God. May you anoint my lips to do what I cannot do in my own flesh, and that is to preach your perfect word. God, we all we all know that if you don't do the work, then it can't be done. You know the hearts of each and every person on the sound of my voice. You know what their personal situation, what their personal dilemma is. And I believe in faith that the Spirit of God shall minister through me as his vessel. Speak in such a way to each and every person's heart that every person on the sound of my voice, that they shall leave with exactly what they came to hear. For you use me, you allow for me to be your vessel, to perform your work, to do the work, O oh God, that only you can do. So Father, I pray right now that you use my tongue as the pen of the ready writer. That every word that flows forth from my lips, that those words, that they are cast upon good ground. I rebuke the enemy. He shall not be able to steal anything. Nothing shall fall upon thorns. Nothing shall fall between the rocks. But it shall all fall upon good ground. And, oh God, I pray that as I plant here tonight, that other laborers shall come and they shall water. And I thank you that you shall receive the increase and the glory from it all. May you be blessed in this time that we have here tonight. And it's through and by the power and the authority of Jesus that we pray. And all those in agreement said, amen. 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 Well, tonight, tonight we're going to deal with, um, we'll go, we're going to go back to obedience. I think the, the first Pinky Promise Conference I preached on, no apology. No, it wasn't no apology. Was it no apology? Might have been no apology. I think it was no apology. Not for sale. That was the first one. Not for sale. Yeah, it was not for sale. Because then the next one was no apologies, where you don't make any apologies for not being for sale to this world. And, uh, and then last, week, uh, last, last year, we, we, dealt with, we dealt with your faith and your obedience. And, and this um, last week, last year, uh, that's what happens when you've been preaching three or four times in a day. You kind of lose sight of what's going on. But then nevertheless, uh, last year, we dealt on obedience. And, and this, this year, we're going to continue that. Amen. Amen. So open up your hearts and your minds and let's let's get into this. So if you want to if you want to take notes to this, if you want to put a title to this, the title of this sermon is Send Me, I'll Go. Send me, I'll go. Send me, I'll go. Now, two very important uh, passages of scripture here that I want to read. I want you to be mindful of. You can write them down. I'm going to read them here. The first one is first Peter, chapter five, verse eight. First Peter, chapter five, verse eight. It says, be sober, be of right mind, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, seeketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Now, I want you to I want to be very careful and very cautious here on how we word this. It does not it does not say that he is a lion. It says that he roars around like one. He has a, it's a if you could if you could if you could see a beast without teeth. This is, this is the kind of image that you will see. He rolls around seeking someone he can devour. Now, I like to watch animal planet shows. I like to watch stuff on animals. I like to watch the predators. I like to watch, you know, the shows on the lions and stuff like that. If you notice something about lions and wolves, they travel in, they travel in these packs. They, they travel in their, in their family. They, they travel in these, in these groups. 
And their sole purpose, when the lionesses, when they go out to hunt, when the wolves go out to hunt, they always search for the animals that's going to be the easiest to take down. They're searching for the easy prey. Now, typically, the easier prey are the, it's, it's the elderly because they're weak. That's why the scripture tells us to care for our elderly, because they're weak. It, care, it, it, you know, if it tells us to care for our widows because they're weak. Now, they're going to look for the elderly. They're going to look for the weak. They're going to also look for the calves. They're going to look for the small animals, our babies. They're going to go after them because they know that if, that, if, the, if the calf is not in the midst of of the herd, if it's not in the midst of the buffalo, if it's not in the midst of the zebra, if it's not in the midst of the gazelle, then if it's on the outside of it, then it can take it. One thing I've learned as a pastor is that sheep are docile animals, although they can have a very, very hard bite. Now, the bite stings. It may not draw blood, but it stings. And if you get bitten by enough sheep, you'll know how bad it stings. But nevertheless, sheep are docile animals, which, which, can, which will bite. But they're very docile. They're not, they're not agitators. They're not going to start war with anybody. But one thing about sheep is that sheep tend, tend to wander off. Now, the good thing that we know based on Scripture is that even if a sheep wanders off, that he, will always, he or she will always know where to come back because the voice of a stranger does not follow. But if a sheep does not come back, it's a good indication that it wasn't a sheep. It was a goat all along. Amen. So now we begin to see something about the predator and the prey, that the, pre that the predator, the, the devil, he roars around like a lion, seeking to whom he may devour. Devouring, not necessarily trying to end the life of the believer, but, but, but necessarily trying to get the life out of the believer in the sense that if I can get you to quit, if I can get you to stop, if I can get you so weary, so bogged down in work and the cares of the world, you won't ever be concerned about spiritual disciplines of prayer and fasting and, and, and supplication and, 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 and meditating in the word because you're too, you're too focused about earthly matters. If I can get you so focused on marriage, if I can get you so focused on anything else that can become an idol in your life, then you won't fight anymore. You won't go anymore. You won't be obedient to what he told you to do. If I can get you so involved in Christian activity, if I can get you at choir practice on Monday night, if I can get you an usher, uh, usher rehearsal on Tuesday night, if I can get you a Bible study on Wednesday night, and Thursday night, if I can get you to, you know, the grown folks choir practice on Thursday night, <laughs> Friday night, you might have a 4-H meeting or you might have a fellowship gathering at your church, depending on if you're, if you're from the country or not. And then on Saturday, you know, Saturday morning, you have another usher meeting because the usher board has to be right. And then on Sunday, you got church and you got, you know, you got a service in the morning and a service at night. You've, you've expended so much activity, but then we have to ask the question, where is the power? So now we've expended so much. We've given so much of ourselves. And when we're worn down, you ever just felt, you ever had somebody come to you and say, I'm just so worn down from ministry. I'm just so worn down. I need to take a break. I'm so worn down. It's because activity, activity has somehow heightened itself above intimacy. When you get so busy with being active for God and not being intimate with God, then you burn out. That's what happens. And isn't it crazy that the one that when we usually get burnt out, when we get, we get burnt out, what's the one place we usually try to leave? The church. But then the craziest thing is, is you get burnt out from the church, and then you try to find other activity to supplement what you used to do, and then you find you go do something else outside of the church to try to take up the time where you claim you've been burnt out from. So, I don't, so I'm not going to go to church anymore because I'm taking a break. But then in the same time, you're not, well, you know, that Sunday where you, where you should have still been serving, still been doing what you're supposed to have been doing, you were taking a break, but then you found something else to do because the park was more enjoyable. Being at the movies with your friend was more enjoyable. But you're burnt out. No, you're not burnt out. The, the enemy is searching for somebody to confuse. That's why it says to be sober-minded. No woman in this room would want to be on the battlefield with another woman who is drunk. Think about it for a second. If I'm standing, if I'm standing and I'm fighting in battle, and, and, and you, you, your, let's just say your best friend, your girlfriend is standing right, your pinky promise, sister, y'all done pinky promise. <laughs> you got your backs next to each other. And she's drunk. She's intoxicated with lust. 
She's intoxicated with ambition. She's intoxicated with business plans. She's intoxicated with everything else except the, except the Spirit of God. She's intoxicated with all activity, and now she's drunk. How much, how much of your confidence do you want to put in her to help protect you? Child, you don't even know how to use your sword. How are you going to help me fight with it? If we're on the battlefield, then how are you going to help me fight with something you don't even know how to use? you got to have that sword of the Spirit locked in on that belt of truth. Where is your shield of faith? Have you put on the helmet of salvation? What's on your feet? Are you fully prepared and armored up to go into battle with me? For some reason, I'm thinking that you're not. And that becomes a problem. The enemy seeks to get you not to be sober-minded, to get you intoxicated. So he can find somebody to devour. How, how, you know, how, how great would it be? You know, how, how would this be to stand before the Lord and you think, I've given 30 years of my life to activity. He looks at you and says, but you did it with the wrong heart. <laughs> you did it with the wrong heart. You did it with the wrong intention. You did it to be recognized by everybody else. You didn't do this for, you didn't do this for me. You did it for yourself. He wants to get you intoxicated. He's roaring around seeking someone to whom he can devour. The other scripture I want you to write down is 2 Chronicles 16 and 9. 2 Chronicles 16 and 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Therefore, from henceforth thou shalt have wars. The eyes of the Lord searcheth the earth to show himself strong to those who truly trust him. Would it be something to realize and to think that as the enemy is searching the world, seeking to those to whom he may devour, that God is searching the world, seeking to those he may use? But too many of us are too busy to ever be used by God. We're too busy. I mean, you know, you're, you're too busy. We got, I mean, you know, come on, people. We're busy folks, right? I mean, think about it. I mean, think of you. You're probably already thinking about what you got to do at home when you get back. <laughs> Monday morning, you get back. You probably think about the work that's already piled up because you're busy. I mean, come on. We got to be busy and important people. We're too important nowadays. You know what I do? I'm in seven different ministries. <laughs> I sing for the choir. Oh, my gosh. It's so exhausting because this is what I do, honey. This is, what, this is who I am. I'm busy. I'm busy. And you're so busy that you're, you're burnt out, you're tired. When's the last time you actually spent quality time in prayer? I'm not talking about just getting a, I'm not talking about opening up your Bible saying I'm going to have a devotion. I mean, devotions are great starting points. But at some point, you got to get, get off the paragraph and finally get into the Word. I want you to go to Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6. Go to Isaiah 6, please. <clears throat> Isaiah 6. Now I'm going to read this in the Amplified Version. Isaiah 6. I'm going to start at verse 7. It says, And with it he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity and guilt are taken away, and your sin is completely atoned for and forgiven. Verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, here I am, send me. And he said, go and tell this people, hear and hear continually, but understand not and see and see continually, but do not apprehend with your mind. Make the heart of this people fat and make, their, and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn again and be healed. And he goes forth, he says, well, how long shall we do this? And we'll, we'll get to that. Well, the Lord asks a very important question. He says, whom shall I send? Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Who will go for us? And I love this. He says, Isaiah stands, he says, send me. Here I am. Why don't you send me? Here I am. Why don't you send me? And the first question I want you to ask yourself is, have you heard the voice of the Lord in telling you where you need to go? Have you heard his voice in telling you what you need to do? If your answer is no, 
then that means you need to get along with him in order to find out exactly what he's telling you to do. You know, it's something when you think about when we think about Christianity today in our Christian culture, we don't think too much about discipline. When you think about a soldier who gets enlisted, drafted into war, when a soldier gets drafted into an army, when he, when he, when he or she, when, when they enlist into the army, when they enlist into the military, they go through a training period where they have to be separated. They have to, it's, it's intense discipline and training for the purpose of making sure that I, can, that I get the right information inside of your head because I don't care if you like it or not. You need to be disciplined in this. So when I tell you you're going to wake up at 2.30 a.m., you wake up at 2.30 a.m. When I say you're going to run six miles, you're going to run six miles. Well, I don't think I can run six miles. I didn't ask you what you thought. But for some reason, we come to God and we say, God, this is what I'm going to do. Well, we wouldn't do that to a general in the army, but we go to God and we say, well, God, it's not you as a general that I see. Because some, for some reason, our generation, our world today, and our society, we have downgraded the deity of Christ. When he is no longer Lord but friend, then you will treat him as such. When you can just sing casually, well, he is my friend. I'm a friend of God. Well, the scripture says you're a friend when you follow his commands. So if you don't follow his commands, then you disqualify yourself from being a friend. And one who's not a friend has to be a You said it, I did. <laughs> but a soldier, a soldier has to go through separation. In fact, it goes through so much separation that the soldier cannot even have contact with the outside world. For several weeks because they, they have to get it into the soldier's mind. They have to retrain the soldier's mind. Romans 12, chapter 12, verse, verse 2. Retraining this mind. Renewing your mind. That's a process that we need to go through. When, you, when, when we get saved, again, I, I tell you this every year. The gospel message is not the end for us. That's the beginning. The cross does not take it. When you take somebody to the cross, they say, I brought you to the cross. This is the place here. We see Jesus. And then that's where we leave people. That's where the cross is. Go ahead and take it. No, 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 no. That's not the place where you leave it. Jesus says, don't just take them to the cross. Make them pick up theirs and go. I'm sending you somewhere else to go. I got somewhere else for you to do. I got something on my mind for you. Yes, you. Specifically, you. So if you don't know what you're supposed to be doing, the best place for you to start is right there in prayer. Well, how long do I sit there? You sit there as ever long as it tells you to speak. A good soldier does not entangle himself in the affairs of the world. Because if you get entangled in the affairs of the world and you start thinking about what the world is doing, and then you get entangled in the real housewives, you get entangled in you know, the Beverly Hills girls, you get entangled in, in, uh, in, in Wendy Hills or Wendy, whatever the girl name is that got the show. If you, get entangled in that, if you get entangled in that mess, then it pollutes your mind. You're not sober-minded. So now you got the word over here, just a piece of the word. But then you got what Wendy Woman said, and now Wendy Woman in your ear, and now you're trying to mix what Wendy said with the word. You're not sober-minded. A good soldier does not entangle himself with the affairs of the world, lest he may be able to do what? To please the one who enlisted him. A good soldier seeks to please the commander who enlisted him. If I have been enlisted in the army, if I fight on the battlefield of the Lord, if I fight in the army of the Lord, then my goal is to please the one who enlisted me. That means that I have to be disciplined. It's not whether, it's not, this is not questionable. This is, I have to be. I have to be sober-minded. Because when I get on the battlefield, the battlefield, if I get on the battlefield and I'm drunk, I'm intoxicated, I'm going to get shot. If I don't know how to use my sword, if my belt of truth is hanging down. See, the reason, the importance of the belt of truth is to hold the Roman. The Romans had to have that belt. It had to be tight around the waist because the belt held up the armor. It kept the sword. So if you don't have the truth, everything else falls down. You thought sagging was something that just came out in the, in the world. Man, this stuff is biblical and spiritual, baby. When your belt is off, when your belt is down, you have no truth. Now your armor falls. And you can't hold your shield up because you're trying to find a place to do with your sword. 
you have no other choice but to be sober-minded. Now, being sent of the Lord is both personal and collective. I love what he says here. He says, who shall I send? Who shall go for us? He says, here I am, send me. But understand something. Although it was personal for him to say, send me, it was a collective, it was a collective understanding that when you go, you're going for somebody else. This is how we come back to this whole selfless thing. That I'm going for somebody else. In our day, it's all about where we're going, where he's sending me for me. But what's going to happen when I get there? What you going to do when I do this? What's going to be when I, when I have what I want? When are you going to give me what I want? Well, how is it going to look when I, when I finally arrive at this place? But it, it's both personal, but it's also collective. More so collective than it is personal. Because you are just a vessel. I love singing, fill me up. I love the song, fill me up, God, fill me up. But what good is it to fill you up when you ain't been poured out? And too many of us can't be filled up with God because we're full of junk from the world. And being sent out is about accepting a commission. Here I am, send me. It's about accepting a commission, accepting the call, not just accepting it, but adhering to it, meaning that I am cementing my feet in the fact that where you have commissioned me, I will fulfill. I will adhere to the call by which you've given me. I will go in the commission by which you have given me. I'm going to make sure that at the end of my life, when I take my last breath, that I have fulfilled the mission and the commission that you've given to me. You know one of the things that we have in, the, in, 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 our, in our Christian culture that we shouldn't have a lot of that we do? Quitters. I can't tell you how many people start something just to quit it. Now, some, I'll be honest with you, some stuff shouldn't have been started anyway. <laughs> but I, I, know, I know both men and women who have started something and quit, started something and quit, started something and quit. I asked one guy, I said, why, did you, why, why, are you, why are you starting and quitting everything? He said, I'm trying to find something that finally breaks through. But if you only give it six months, I mean, hey, you even, tomatoes even, even need more time than that just to, just to pop up through the ground. You got to give time for the roots to grow. We quit too early. We, we quit too quick. You know, I, I think about some of the young women. Yo, y'all have sent messages to my wife. And you'll say, oh, you know, I started a pinky promise school thing. God has put such a burden on my heart to reach the women in the community. <laughs> Whew. I'm so burdened. I pray about it every single night. I think about it. I moan and I groan in anguish. He's given me such a desire. I started the group two weeks ago and ain't nobody came. Woo. I've been fasting and praying for the last two hours trying to figure out why ain't nobody coming. Sister Heather, would you please help me to understand? Because I'm on the verge of just saying this ain't for me. Can I, can I be honest with you about something? When it's a passion, when it's a passion, you don't quit on that. Somebody asked me, when will you retire from being a pastor? When it's a passion, you don't retire from that. How do you retire from doing something God called you to do? If it's a commission, I'll be like, Paul, I, I, hey, I crossed the finish line. I may have to crawl over the thing, but I, 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 have, I crawled over the finish line. This isn't a profession. When it's a passion, I'm not speaking of your profession here. I'm not speaking of your profession. A commission is a passion. Birthed by God. If God has placed such a desire in your heart to reach women, you know, you see, that's the kind of stuff that wakes you up in the middle of the night. You can't sleep on that. You wake up with a burning desire. How can I help somebody else? This is bigger than me. When I go to my prayer closet, you go in your prayer closet ready to go to war, not for yourself. Even though it seems like all the hell breaks in your life, you like, forget about this. There's some women out there that still need Jesus. It's a commission. I got to fulfill this commission. I got something I got to finish. I got something I got to do. It's a war out here. My sisters are out here dying on the battlefield. 
So forgive me if I don't have time to go to the movies all the time with you. Forgive me if I don't have the time to be a part of your traveling sister club. Forgive me if I don't have time to read your books that don't glorify God. Forgive me if that's what you think I'm supposed to be doing. I'm fighting. This is active war. And our war isn't physical. Stop fighting with everybody else around you. You're trying to fight with mom and him at home. Stop fighting with your kids. Stop fighting with that kind of stuff. Fight the way we know to fight. Go into prayer. Fight. Go into war. Go into that prayer closet. Fight. Use the word. Fight. The passion wakes you up in the middle of the night. Oh, you can't hardly sleep. I remember my wife, she would, she would come to me, and she, she'd wake up, and she'd be like, baby. And I'm like, why are you crying? Because I, just, I, was, I was just looking online, and there's this girl who, you know, she's just, she's, uh, she was, she, uh, somewhere she had, she had killed herself. She committed suicide. I said, baby, I said, why are you crying? She said, because if only I would have done something, maybe, I, I, I don't know, I gotta, we got to find a way to reach them. So that's a desire. That's a passion. That's a passion. You can't teach people that. You don't get that from a self-help book. You don't get that from a sermon. A passion is what's within you. And a God-given, spirit-led passion, a God-given, spirit-led passion is going to be bigger than you, and it's going to always give glory, for, glory to God. If, the, if, those two, if those two things ain't it, I guarantee it didn't come from the Lord. Is going to always give glory to God. He gives gifts to those for the what? For the glorification of his holy name. He gives gifts for the edification of his church. He does things so he may be glorified in them. You are but the vessel. But can we expend ourselves? Step out of ourselves and our own problems for just a little while. But... But dear pastor, you don't understand all of the issues and all the things breaking down in my life. You know, one of the things that I, I, I've, I've learned through, this, through these, these short years of my life is that it, usually it, it becomes easier for me to deal with my own issues when I focus on helping somebody else with theirs. When I learned the value of serving somebody else, it taught me something about not just being concerned about myself. See, I can sit at home and cry and complain and throw me a pity party because I don't have bread to eat myself. But if I look out and I say, well, there's somebody else that ain't got any bread to eat, I'm going to just go find somebody else. And see, this is the good thing about serving, dude. This is the good thing about having a passion about something because when God sees that you're out there helping somebody else, it's just something about it. It just comes along with the daily bread. It just happens like that. But see, a passion, a commission, what God told you to do, it's going to be about the glorification of his church, be about the glorification of his name. Your reaction to the question of being sent determines everything. Your reaction to the question of being sent determines everything. Who shall I send? I want you to picture that one now. Who shall I send? Who shall go for us? Who shall I send? Who shall go for us? Your reaction to the question determines everything. Let's look at, 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 at a couple guys. The first one let's look at is, is Moses. Moses. Now, <laughs> Moses in Exodus 10, Moses says, Lord, here I am, but send Aaron. Lord, here I am. But have you considered Aaron? I don't know if I want to go do that. That's, that's the person who is present, mostly active, but still won't go. This is the one who is fully aware of the need and the commission but won't go. This is the one that is focused more on self of why God can't use you to meet the need instead of how God will meet the need through you. 
Because isn't that a big focus of ours? Well, how is God going to meet the need for that? When God is saying, I don't want, I don't want you to worry about my business. I just told you to go. And when you get there, I'm going to give you the provision of what you need to meet the need. You don't play my game. You don't think for me. I do that for you. You reprogram your mind to think, to think like I do. You trust me. Here I am, Lord, but man, you better send Aaron. Well, you telling me to do what? I know I got a passion for women, but you know, to help out some women, Lord, but you telling me to do something. You better, did you add, did you add the Pinky Promise girl in Lexington, Kentucky? <laughs> you trying to send me to the country. Are you kidding me? I am a city girl. Are you, are you, you trying to send me to Alaska? No, no, no. I rebuke you, devil, in the name of Jesus. I heard it's cold up there. They got polar bears or something. I don't know. I read it somewhere. You trying to send, no, oh, Lord. I know I'm present. I know I'm active, but you better send somebody else. You looking at the wrong one now, Lord. Don't send me. I'm present, though. I'm ready to fight for you, Lord. And this is what we do. This is what we do. This is what we do. We'll say, Lord, wherever you want me to go. (laughs) Wherever you want me to go, Lord, I'll go. Lord, I want you to go over there. Yeah. You didn't let me finish. <laughs> what, I, what my prayer was was, wherever you want me to go, except there. <laughs> that ain't my calling, Lord. You know how you made me. <laughs> because you made me that way. I'm active, I'm present, but man, you better send Heather. <laughs> she might want to go. I think she probably want to go. She'll love to go. Did you consider her? <laughs> These are the people who rationalize the commission. They rationalize it. They don't see it as optional. You know, when my, my friends who are in the military, I have one guy who, who enlisted in the military, and I have another guy who went in, he went in, as, he, went in he went to school through... Uh, uh, in Colorado, I forget, the Air Force Academy up there. Um, anyway, he, he, went, he went through there, and, and he came out as a, as a lieutenant. And then he, he got into the military, and, and he had to serve his years. And I asked him, I said, so where are you going to go? And, he, and I said, are you going to pick the place you want to go? He said, I can't choose. Hold up, what you, what you mean you can't choose? He said, I'm, I got to go wherever they send me. So what if you don't go? Well, now you've been disobedient. So you get reprimanded for going somewhere you don't want to go? What? (laughs) Now, how is it that we put so much stake into that? When we receive a holy commission from God, we rationalize it. I got guys now who 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 are being commissioned off to Afghanistan, being commissioned off to somewhere else, and they don't want to go. But you want to know something? When, 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 When you understand the commission... You go above your feelings. Don't matter how you feel about going. He he didn't ask you about how you felt about it. He gave you a commission. He gave you a journey. He gave you a goal. He said, I want you to go. And not be concerned about what's going to happen when you get there. They rationalize the commission. They search for somebody else to go for them. Or here's another one. They disqualify themselves. Well, God, I would go, but you already know I I got a child. (gasps) <gasps> Who gonna help me? I'm all by myself. I'm all by myself, Lord. Who do you trust? Who do you trust? We can laugh about that. I mean, you can. Let me, let me, can, I, can, I, can I tell you something? Kids are never an excuse. They're always a reason. You take gifts with you. You don't leave them back home. 
You'll find a way to get a brand new car to the place he told you to go. Oh, I can't, why, 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 why do you feel like a kid needs it? Why, why, are you, are you kidding me? You thought, you thought God said, well, you know, you have a kid, well, then maybe I'm, gonna, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm, I'm just going to leave you alone then. Because you got a child, so I'm going to feel sorry for you. No, you still got a commission. You still got something to do. There's still a passion burning in your heart. You still got something to do. And when he commissions you, that's not debatable. That's not optional. Well, I don't know what is going to happen. That's what's called faith. <laughs> That's why it's called faith. We want all the answers up front. <laughs> and then here's another one we do. We complain about the work that, should, that, that, that we should be doing. <laughs> you know how many people, especially as a pastor, I get people coming to me and they'll say, you know, pastor, I have so many issues with the church. <clears throat> I have so many issues with the church. You know, I, I, feel like, I feel like women's ministry, I feel like women's programs, I, you know, women's and things, it, it can be done so many different ways. Well, where did the Lord commission you? What's your passion? Well, I have, a, I have a deep passion for women. Well, why are you sitting up here giving me all your problems? Your first turn should be Jesus. If you got issues, then where are the solutions? See, leaders bring solutions. Pinky promise leaders, you don't bring problems. You bring solutions. If you have a problem, then you say, this is, this is the issue, but guess what? I got three different solutions that can help solve this problem. I've been in prayer. I've been on my face. I know what the, what the, what, what the solution can be to solve this issue. The same Holy Spirit that, that, that operates in other bodies, that operates in you. Why do you think he'll give it to somebody else and not give it to you? One spirit, one unity of faith. One hope, one calling. Are you kidding me? One body. But we complain about the work. Somebody complain about the work that we should be doing. And then you have Jonah. <laughs> oh, you already know where I'm going with Jonah. <laughs> Here's the question: Who shall I send? Who shall go for us? Well, here I am, Lord, but you ain't sending me. <laughs> <laughs> You want me to go where? Nineveh. Uh-uh, them people crazy. Mm -mm. That's like telling you present day right now to go over to Syria. Oh, look at that. Woo, woo, woo. Mmm. Mmm. I'm going to need to pray about that one, Pastor. Hey, Robo. Mmm. Hey. Mmm. <laughs> We usually mock Jonah because he didn't, he didn't want to go. But if you, if, you, if you realize where he was told to go, you would understand why Jonah was like, uh -uh, I would probably rather stay, in, rather stay in this belly of this fish than to go over there. Are you And get, tell them what? You want me to give them a message of judgment from you? Do you know how crazy they are? Jonah said, here I am, but you ain't sending me. This is a reality for many of us. We'll hear what he says, and even then we'll say, yeah, but you ain't going to send me. I'm not going. I'm not going. This is disobedience and full-out rebellion to a specific work of God that he's called you to do. These are people who are more concerned about self than they are souls. More concerned about self than they are so. But what if I get there and what if I die? Well, then you die. Well, then you, you died. You died being obedient to what he told you to do. <laughs> See, the reason why the reason why the devil had to worry about killing you is because an, an army in, in the army, when a soldier dies on the battlefield, is seen as a great act of honor. You died in war. Your body is draped by the flag. You are carried in a processional. You're usually buried in, a, in, a, in prime real estate. You're, you're put in the ground. And it, it, it's usually seen as a place of, it's usually honorable. And, and, and it's, it's, a great, it's a great act of sacrifice. But when you're a coward on the battlefield, people look at you and they say, what, what is, I don't want to fight with him. I don't want to fight with her. It's a coward. But we don't look at it the same way when God tells us to go do something. These are people who make excuses for not going and make plans as to how they will live in their rebellion. I'm not going. I don't care what he tell me because I'm not going to go. And you know what? I don't believe none of that stuff in the church anyway. 
because the church just want my money and that's all they want from me and that's all God been doing. God ain't really about trying to do nothing for me. I don't even believe half of that stuff that I be hearing out there about God anyway. And then we just, we, we just, we just get into further disobedience to learn how we're going to live out our rebellion. Well, I'm going to just turn away from the church because here are all my problems with the church. <laughs> church ain't done nothing for you. The church ain't done nothing to you. Well, you're more concerned about the people. Well, you're more concerned about the people inside the church and you're not concerned about the one you're called to serve. That was your issue. You focus, you focus more on the people who hurt you than the one who can heal you. That's like focusing more on the scar than you do the physician. If I'm hurt, I go to the one who heals. But in our rationale, and our carnal thinking, we think, well, I'm going to just live in my full-out rebellion. These are the people who just flat out say, I'm not going. But then the last one you have is Isaiah, which we just read in 6 and 8. Here I am, send me. This is a person who has heard the voice. Heard the voice. The, hearing the voice is both personal and convicting. Personal in the fact that nobody could have heard it except you. Personal in the fact that you make no apologies because you heard it and nobody else did. Convicting in the fact that you know that you heard it with such great amount of faith that you act out on it. Convicting in the fact that you, can, that you know what you heard in faith, you can prove in the word. That you know that whatever he called you to do is going to bring glory to him, is going to edify his body. This is one who recognizes the need and the commission is greater than self. Think about for a moment, if you could just imagine, if all the women, every woman in this room lived in all-out purpose, you think about how many more women that you would not be able to fit in this room. See, <laughs> When, 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 we, when we hear, you know, Christ builds his church through the edification of the body, when you go back to Ephesians, it says, you know, he gives us certain gifts. He gives us those gifts for the what? For the edification of the body so he can do what? The work of the ministry. See, as, you, as, you're, as you're being edified right now to being built up, the goal is not for you to become fat off information. It's about the information that I get. I go back out and I'm commissioned. That's how we grow by multiplication, not addition. Because you multiply others. See, as you get older and as you have children, you grow, you, you, you're growing and you're beginning to have, have children. How many spiritual babies have we given birth to? How many souls are we still praying for? How, how long have we been laboring in prayer for the one who still hasn't heard? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a lot that goes into this. But just think for a second, if every woman in this room lived out God-given purpose, if, if, if you finally took the bitterness out of your heart long enough, you took, that little, you took that jealousy that you think just a little bit, but it's all over you, you see it in your face, you just mad, mean. If you took that jealousy out of you if, you, if you stop fighting your sisters long enough to finally reach out to some more and say, you know what, I, I, I know you're hurting, girl. I, I was too. And I tried all this stuff in the world, but you want to know something? I got in a relationship with Jesus Christ. He changed my life. But you know, you don't know something. But see, but see, I, I've already heard that. I've heard, all, I've heard all that church stuff. Church ain't for me. I ain't talking to you about church, girl. I'm talking to you about salvation. You got a misconception. You thought I was talking about people. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, but, but I heard about him. Obviously, you didn't hear about the right one. Because when you hear about the Savior, he opens the eyes of the blind. He makes the lame walk. He gives sight when you, when you couldn't see. He gives, he gives hearing to the ones who's deaf. If you telling me you had a you, that you encountered, that you heard about Jesus Christ and you weren't changed, honey, you didn't hear about the real Jesus. This is the one who is not willing to place the responsibility on somebody else. 
one of the things, a great criticism I have of our generation is that we like to pass the buck to somebody else. Well, why did that happen? Because somebody else did it. Well, if somebody else would do it. Well, if somebody else would help our neighborhoods. If somebody else, it, who, who going who to come in and fix this? If you're so passionate about it, why don't you get a wrench and go fix it? I just went all back up that backwood Mississippi. I'll get you a rain. Go fit. If you're so passionate about it, go on and get you some. Go on and get you something and fix it. If you if you're so bad, you know all the answers. Now let's go through some of the things he sent us to do, and I'll be done. He sends us to do what? Matthew 5, 13 through 15. You can write these, write these verses down. You can go back and you can study them later on. Matthew 5, 13 through 15. Send us out to be the salt of the earth. The salt of the earth. The salt that does not, leave, that does, that does not lose its savor. In Matthew 5, 14 through 16. He sends us out to be the light of the world. Not to eclipse the world, but to be the light of the world. To be the light of the world. Meaning that in the midst of darkness, you can still shine bright. To be the light of the world. I mean, how can, you have to think, you think, just think rationally for a second. How can you possibly stand out if you're always trying to fit in? I'm just, I, I, my wife and I, we just rationalize some things in our mind. It's just some stuff we just can't do. Places we just can't go. Stuff we just not, it's just stuff we just not going to agree to. It doesn't matter how much money you throw at us. You can give us the best contract you think you're going to have. We're going to still tell you, nope, because our character's worth a whole lot more than that. You can't control my light. You can't edit out my light. First Peter 4, 7 through 11. Sending out to use our spiritual gifts to edify the church. Using our spiritual gifts. I mean, you, you got to think, you know, encouragement, edification. Using these things to edify, to build up the church. Not using things to come and tear down the church. Using things to build it up. I mean, how do we build this thing up? How do we encourage using our spiritual gifts to build up the church. Sending us out to caring for the fatherless and the widows. Caring for those who are less fortunate. Sending us out in Romans 10, 12 through 15. Romans 10, 12 through 15. To fulfill the call of evangelism. To fulfill the call of evangelism. Let me tell you something. Ministry doesn't start when you get a, when you get a cute logo and you get a Facebook page. <laughs> that ain't ministry. You can get a thousand people on there. You ain't, I mean, because you put up a quote every day. Praise the Lord for you. They can get that from the Bible. What are we doing? What are we doing? Are, are we, are, can, we, can we fulfill the call of evangelism? You know, one of, uh, you know, one, one of, the, things that, one of the things that has been really convicting to me is that, you know, you get, you get to a place where it's... It, it becomes backwards. Are we sending, are we telling people come to us? Or are we fulfilling a commission and going to them? Go into all the earth. He didn't say, tell the whole earth to come to you. Because when they come to you, it's comfortable and convenient for you. He's saying, no, I'm going to send you out with no clothes, no money. I'm going to send you out with nothing. You're going to go out barefoot. But when you come back, I'm going to ask you, lack ye anything? Lord, I didn't lack a thing. I ate every day. I know sometimes I didn't know I thought I'd get kicked out of my place. But you, you know what? You just kept providing. And then when I did, I lost that place. But then you gave me another one. And then I was over here, but the whole time you told me to keep serving over here, and then I didn't see where that was going to come. Then I just said, Lord, I cast my cares on you. Then I just quit worrying for some reason. <laughs> it's like that whole word thing I kept reading and kept studying over. It just worked when I finally worked it. Yeah. 
Acts 5 and 28, sending us out to teach the community the gospel. Acts 5 and 28, teach the community the gospel. Another one is to help build a local church, being faithful where you are. That's something that you know, our generation can, can be much better about as well, faithfulness. A lot of us ain't faithful to nothing but ourselves. <laughs> faithful. You know, we, we, have to put extra, we have to put emphasis on the local church. There's power in the local church. There is power in the local church. The local church can have power to reach communities. It can have power to reach people. There's power in the local church. And, and you, you can't, when, when, when you're at a place and God has you, God has you planted and stationed there, your, your work there is important. You're serving as unto the Lord, not as unto the pastor. You're not looking for somebody to pat you on the back every 15 minutes. If you're looking for a handout and acceptance from people, then you're in the wrong business. We do it unto the Lord. He appreciates. He'll tell me if I'm doing something right. I, I'm, I'm quite confident Paul, when he snake been shipwrecked, wanted to get in the Lord to say, you're doing good. Give, send me a letter, tell me I'm fine. Throw me a pastor's appreciation banquet. <laughs> tell me I'm doing fine. Send me a letter, Festival of Nica. Tell me I'm good to you, church. <laughs> if not, I might quit. Because ain't nobody appreciating me lately. I've been standing at this door for five minutes ushering people. <laughs> and pastor ain't even told me thank you. Man, your heart ain't right. Sit down. <laughs> you immature. Come on, sit down. We got, we got to teach you something, baby. You, you, want, you want people to appreciate you. Man, you, you work for the Lord, okay? You work for the Lord. And the great thing about it, when you work for the Lord, he gives you a reward. Because when I give you a reward, it's for everybody to see you've been paid. But when the Lord gives you a reward, he rewards openly. They may not have seen the work. But he rewards openly. Where'd that come from? It's a reward. You didn't see it? I wasn't asking you for it, but he just gave it. Don't be mad at it. You can't be jealous at this. He just, he, he, I didn't ask for it. And then another one, a big one, the last one. John 1, 40 through 42. To teach your family and friends the gospel. Before we can be strong leaders in our community and abroad, we have to learn to be strong at home. Strong and strengthened at home. Teaching our family, teaching our children the word of God, teaching them the message. I mean, think about it, ladies. If all of y'all, and I, I wouldn't even say all, let's just say half. Half of the women in this room took this to heart and said, you know what? There's something out there that's much bigger than me. And then you can, you can throw all the excuses. Let's throw something out there. Well, Cornelius, I'm afraid. Okay. And what? He didn't give you the spirit of fear. So obviously if he didn't give it to you, then where do you think it came from? He didn't give you that. So now let that go. Well, you know, I'm still afraid. Well, then you know what? Look at the fear and do it anyway. Well, I don't know what's going to happen. That's why it's called faith. you got to trust him. Well, I've been hurt by people in my past. Well, forgive them and let it go. You've been holding on to the same thing for the last 10 years of your life. You want to spend 10 more years in this? But he raped me, beat me, tortured me. Slapped me across my face, called me all kind of names, told me I was a nothing, told me I was a nobody. But while you're so focused on that, can you think for a second about the one who was beaten for you? Tortured. Thorns drove into his head. Nailed to a cross. <laughs> Died and came back, took the keys straight from hell, rendered them powerless. You so focused about the person who did something to you. <laughs> and I'm telling you, stop focusing so much on the person. 
Look at the one. Look at the one. Look at the one who has imputed righteousness, who has given salvation, who has made it available for you to come behind the veil. Who separated, the, who separated and made sure that there was a place for you to enter in that gives you the ability to boldly approach the throne of grace. I'm talking about the one who, 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 who when, when the veil was split between the Jew and the Gentile, that he split it and he said, no longer there shall there be a distinction. Cornelius, I'm afraid my past is hindering me. If only you know what I've done. <laughs> Everybody in here has a past. But the good thing about it is the same blood that cleansed mine. <laughs> has the ability to cleanse yours. And when the old man is nailed to the cross, when he's crucified, then I am resurrected and born anew. That while I may have been born a certain way, I am being born again. I walk anew. My mind is renewed. I'm walking with new faith, with new hope, with new life. There's something else out there bigger than me. You, you get, then tell yourself, you've been spending the last 25 years of your life focused on yourself. Women are dying out here. Children dying in the streets. A young girl right now sitting in the corner of her bedroom afraid to go to sleep because a man that she knows in her house is going to come after her to knock on her door. You've probably been through it. There's a young girl out there who can use your encouragement. Women sitting in shelters who can use your encouragement. Women coming down poles who can use your encouragement, who can tell you, you know what, I've been there. I'm telling you, I know Jesus. you got to know him too. calling on boldness. 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 And the last one. Well, you know what, Pastor? I don't know where to start. Like any soldier who needs the next set of commands, you go to the commander and you stay with the commander until he gives you the next set of commands. If that means you got to cleanse your plan, you got you to you, you take apart your calendar because all the things that you had planned that you thought you were going to do, go ahead and clear your schedule. When people ask you, what are you clearing your schedule for? Because I got a meeting. Well, what you doing Wednesday at 1? I got a meeting. What you searching for? Passion. Purpose. I can't be lukewarm. He spits them out of his mouth. No. 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 I'm not going to my grave with purpose still left in me. Mm -mm. Nope. Nope. Uh -uh. I don't care what generational curse they claim I was, I was going to inherit. It ain't going to come with me. No, it's not. It stopped right here. I got, I got a meeting. 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 Who you meeting with? Well, I, okay, do you want to know him? I can introduce you to him. He's the one who set me free, made me whole. When I was lost, he found me. When I was broke, hurt, and blind, he made me content, made me whole, and made me see. You, I, I, got, I got a meeting. 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 And you get with your sisters. You get with your sisters, and y'all gather together. And you say, girl, you know, you know what yours is? Yeah, he, he, he gave me my commission. Okay, well, then I, I need mine. Well, I'm going to intercede for you. We're going to find it. Come on. Come on. Lock up with me. Lock up with me. We on this same battlefield. Lock up with me. I'm not fighting you. Lock up with me. I'm in a sea for you. Come on. Let's go. No, put that away. Pick, he didn't tell you to pick that up. Put that down. No, nope, get out of that. No, nope, that's an idol. No, nope, let that go. No, nope, break that. No, nope, let it go. Come on. Lock up. 
You got to go. Come on, walk. Uh-uh. I got a meeting. I got a meeting. I got a meeting. I got a meeting. He's asked who he going to send. He's asking who he going to send. And he sent Jesus. That's the one he was talking about. He was going to send. Send me. He'll go. He sent Jesus. And now that he sent Jesus, Jesus is sending me. I'll be his hands and his feet. You know what? His words don't come out of my mouth. And I, I need to learn his words. I, I, I need to learn his words. I need, to, I need to know how to rightfully divide his words. Girl, I got a meeting. I got a meeting. So now the final question I have for you, ladies and gentlemen, is what is your response? Will it be, send me, or here I am, but send Aaron? Send my sister, send her, send my mama, send my pastor. Or will it be, here I am, but I'm not going. I'm not going. I'm not going. Or will it be, here I am, send me. Send me. I let go of my will. I let go of my plans. I let go of my goals. Send me. Baby, come up here, baby. Send me. For those women in here who have an undying passion, birth on the inside of them. It's been stagnant for way too long. Stagnant for way too long. And you say, you know what? <laughs> he, he, he told me to go, I gotta go. I can't be scared anymore. I can't be scared anymore. You, you find your way in some aisles, into some stuff. You need to praise and worship your way into this thing. Whatever you've been holding on to, whatever you've been carrying, the hurt, the unforgiveness, the heaviness, this is the place where you're going to let that stuff go. You put your baggage down. Put it down. Lay aside every encumbrance. Lay aside every weight of sin that so easily besets you, that so easily causes you to stumble, that so easily causes you to stop. Lay it aside. Put it on the, put it, just lay it down. Confessing with your mouth, I can't be the same after this. Don't hold it in, just let it go. 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 go. I'm believing by faith right now, the Holy Spirit's working on some of your hearts. Some of you that came in here, rock cold hearts, he's melting it right now. The walls that you built up in your heart, he's breaking it down right now. He's breaking down every, every brick. Mm. Glory be unto his name. Glory be unto his name. Glory be unto his name. There's some junk y'all not taking back home with you. There's some relationships. There's some relationships you, you've been you've been needing to let go. You, you hey, you you you've already made up in your mind. It's done. It's over. It's gone. Mm -mm. No. No. You find your corner. You find someone. We're gonna we're gonna praise our way into this thing. God inhabits the praise of His people. We're gonna ask Him to show up that He may heal. He'll deliver. He'll set free. There's a commission out there that's bigger than you. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than all of this. It's bigger than all of this. And while our laborers, as the scripture says, may be few, 
think for a moment in this. It only took a few apostles to turn the whole world upside down. We're going to worship our way into here. Amen. Amen. Set free, make whole. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You called me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. Yes, Lord Jesus. And there I find you in the mysteries and hope.
Let his restructuring take place in you. Let his restoration take place in you. comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he'll love nothing more than to steal the deliverance that, you, that you're getting in this place right now. But it's this time that you practice taking up the shield of faith that withstands every fiery dark. It's in this time that you yoke yourself together with your sister. And you say, I'm not fighting you no more. I'm on edify. I'm on build up. We got work to do. There's some stuff we got to do. I got some work to do. You understand? I got some work to do. Now, he's going to come. I guarantee you, as soon as you leave out those doors, you might get a phone call. You might get a text message. You might go back to your car. That might be a blessing. Something might happen. Make up in your mind right now, that no matter what happens, the allegiance and the decision and the response that you gave to the question right now still stands. And who shall I send? And you boldly declare, Lord, send me. I won't be afraid of the, the arrows that fly by night. I'm not going to be afraid of the bullets that may fly by day. I won't be afraid of the pestilence around me. I won't be afraid. I won't be scared. I'm going to walk this thing out. I'm going to do what you told me to do. Send me. And for the other of you in here that you still trying to harden your heart to this, you're still trying to harden your heart to it? I tell you something, sister. You might as well go and let it go. Don't leave from this place with the same thing you had when you came in. When you're sick, you go to the hospital to be healed. You expect for the doctor to give you something that's going to make you well. When you get the medicine, you don't turn it away. When you hear the word, you don't cast it upon soul. You don't cast it upon thorny ground. Yeah. You hear it and receive it. So as we continue to worship, you might as well go ahead and just let it go. Let it go. Let go of the unforgiveness. Let go of the hurt. Let go of the pain. Just go and let it go. Just go on and let it go. 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 Worship, worship is worship is great in an act of war. Where everybody else out there fighting in the streets, I'm gonna just play my heart. I'm gonna worship.
to our grave of ashes and ashes. We won't leave this earth before it's time. But even if we have to crawl over the finish line, because we've given everything we got, and we live this life with absolutely no regrets, not concerned about how old we are, thinking maybe we missed it because of our age. But even as an elder, you call us out to teach those who are young. Oh God, that we don't look at our youth and disqualify ourselves. But we look and we say that yet we are young we can still be powerful in Christ. And we can bring real change to our communities, to our schools, to our colleges. Help us, Lord. Help us to see that our issues of our society are not skin deep. They're not skin deep. We fight not against, we fight not against the shade of one's skin. It's not skin deep. This is spiritually deep. This cuts to the heart. The wickedness comes out of any man, no matter his color. raise up other generations. Regardless of where you came from, or who's thrown you away, or who has ignored you and said that you're not going to amount to anything, I believe the Lord 
Lord is raising up this generation for such a time as this. I don't believe that millennials are running away from the Lord. I believe that they're just separate. They can tell what's fake. They can tell what's not authentic and they're not going to follow after it. They're tired. They just don't want his hand. You see, they know that uh, that'll come. They just want, they want God's heart. And they're not going to follow after preachers and people that are just feeding them garbage anymore. They're testing every spirit. They're being discerned. I believe that you're a part of this generation that's going to go out into the earth and share the right truth going to clean up the mess from those before you. And you're going to walk this thing out so people see there's just something different about you. What's so authentic about you? I just don't know what it is.
focus back on him holy are you lord god are you lord god the more we lift him up everything else becomes small say worthy is the lamb worthy is the lamb
heaven is open. I can hear it in this room. If you let this night go by without making your request known, you've done yourself a disservice. Heaven is open.